Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, Flora, Mississippi is home to Monsanto's new southern corn breeding facility. A billion dollar food safety overhaul bill is signed by President Obama, while a study shows no-till and crop rotation can improve air quality. In southern gardening, water features, they're a great addition to your landscape, and they come in all shapes and sizes. In the markets, a surprise for grains in Wednesday's crop numbers. And in the cattle sector, a cautionary note for those wanting to buy feeders. In the feature segment, you'll meet a southeast Mississippi cattleman who says stocker cattle production makes him more money than tree farming. He grows trees on his place, but at this point in his life, stocker cows fit his goals. Most of the farms around here are pine trees, and we do have pine trees on some of our land around here also. We think that's a good investment, but uh, we also think that while we're able to get out here and really work, and uh, put in the effort that cattle make a lot better rate of return on investment right now than pine trees. everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. One of the nation's major players in seed production has opened a new corn facility in Mississippi. Leighton, the Monsanto company officially opened its second southern breeding station on Tuesday. It's located in central Mississippi in the Flora Industrial Park northwest of Jackson. The 24,000 square foot facility costs $2.4 billion to build. It has nine full-time staff. It will hire, however, 50 to 60 seasonal workers in the summer months. The facility brings to four the number of research sites Monsanto operates in Mississippi. Monsanto also owns the Delton Pine Land Company of Scott, Mississippi, a major producer of cottonseed and soybean seed. Mississippi is the only state with Monsanto corn, soybean, and cotton breeding programs. Monsanto is recruiting Mississippi farmers to, to host test plots. These will total 200 to 250 acres. Plots will also be planted in Alabama, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Monsanto said it chose the Flora Jackson area because it was centrally located and it offered a great quality of life to its employees. And Leighton, of course, why here? Well, when you're breeding plants, you have to try to breed them in the areas where they're going to be used. You just can't take a Midwest corn variety, bring right. it down here and expect it to do well. And of course, Mississippi State has, has stations around the state where it does some of the same thing, testing varieties to let growers know. And obviously so, proximity mm -hmm. to the Mississippi Delta and that soil was a factor. I think so as well. So uh, anyway, it looks like Mississippi's becoming a hometown for Monsanto. <laughs> Certainly does. Thanks, Artis. Well, many farmers appreciate the economic savings of no-till, but a new study now shows that it and crop rotation can actually improve air quality. Also, President Barack Obama signed into law last week a $1.4 billion overhaul of the nation's food safety system. The law leaves U.S. Department of Agriculture still in charge of the inspections for many sectors, but many say this bill is needed. Mark Pearson brings us up to date. The new law emphasizes prevention to help stop deadly outbreaks of foodborne illness before they occur, instead of reacting after people become ill. It calls for increasing government inspections at food processing facilities and for the first time gives the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, the regulatory power to order the recall of foods in question. Much of the $1.4 billion cost is attributable to hiring about 2,000 new FDA inspectors. That could prove to be a sound investment since the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, estimates foodborne illnesses cost the nation $152 billion annually. President Obama made improving food safety a priority shortly after taking office in 2009 in response to several deadly outbreaks of E. coli and salmonella poisoning in peanuts, eggs, and produce over the past few years. Most major food companies are backing the bill, 
Recent outbreaks blamed on tainted spinach and other foods have hurt the industries financially as consumers reacted to recalls and in some cases stopped buying their products. The CDC recently estimated that 48 million people, or one in six Americans, are sickened every year by a foodborne illness. Of that, 180,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 die. Some Republican lawmakers are complaining that the measure is too expensive and are threatening to stop its funding. Iowa Democrat Tom Harkin, a lead sponsor of the bill, acknowledged the tough spending decisions that will have to be made. But he said in a statement, fiscal responsibility does not necessitate abandoning or neglecting the need of American consumers for safe food. The food safety law also imposes new safety regulations on producers of the highest risk fruits and vegetables and requires processors to prepare food safety plans detailing steps they are taking to keep food safe at different stages of production. The FDA would use the information to trace recalled foods. The new law exempts meat, poultry, and processed eggs since they are regulated by the Agriculture Department. Also exempt are some small businesses which had complained that the new requirements could force them into bankruptcy. Advocates of no-till farming picked up a victory with the release of a study showing the further adoption of no-till practices has considerable benefit on air quality. A study conducted by Purdue University shows no-till fields released 57% less nitrous oxide than those prepared by a chisel plow. The reduction of much maligned greenhouse gas also is reduced 40% when moldboard plowing is used over chisel tilling. The federally funded study led by Purdue University's Tony Vine looked at the amount of nitrous oxide released during the last three growing seasons. Vine says the soil disturbance and residue placement impacts of chisel plowing and moldboard plowing modify the soil physical and microbial environments such that more nitrous oxide is created and released. Another discovery of the study was the air quality benefit of crop rotation. While of course no-till farming has been thought to reduce soil erosion and improve soil quality, according to Vine, emissions were lowered 20% in fields where corn and soybeans alternate from year to year. An EPA report released last year revealed 68% of nitrous oxide emission in the U.S. in 2008 came from farmland, and the U.S. emissions of the gas grew 6% between 1990 and 2008. According to EPA, nitrous oxide is the third most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, with 310 times more heat-trapping power than carbon dioxide, due in part to the 120-year lifespan of the gas. Well, water features in the landscape can be soothing and relaxing. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us some great ways to add the benefits of moving water to your landscape. One of my favorite garden features is moving water. With winter in full force, let's sit back and take a look at some great uses of water in the landscape. Water features don't have to be large to have big effects. This gardener created the illusion of a pond covered with this hardy ice plant and decorative frogs. And here this tabletop fountain with the cherubs under the umbrella creates a soothing sound to relax on the patio and enjoy the landscape. One of my favorites is this fish pond surrounded by a mass of tropical alocasia. Surrounded by the various sizes of rounded river rock, this display has a familiar feeling. The statue of the fisherman nestled in the dense alocasia and the riopi foliage gives the appearance of a mischievous boy sneaking into fish at a forbidden fishing hole. I also like the fountain made from the used gristmill stone. The duck and frog statuary give the appearance of the animals being drawn to the flowing water. The sight and sound of water creates a peaceful and relaxing atmosphere. Here a large urn has been transformed into a fountain. Sitting on a bed of river rock surrounded by banana and iris, it appears the water is flowing through the urn directly back into the ground. And the combination of fire and water adds an additional layer of interest in this fountain. The flames surrounded by the sight and sound of running water can certainly set the stage for a relaxing evening. So while it's cold outside this winter, imagine what the addition of a water feature could do for you and your landscape. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says that moving water can add relaxing sights and sounds to your landscape and it doesn't have to be a budget buster. 
Well, in our feature segment today, a lot of people want to make money with cattle. Well, Sean Mercer of Richton is making stocker cattle work for him. He says they're better than trees. Time now for the Marks with Leighton. And Leighton, you say some of this week's crop forecasts were under enough that the market was caught by yes, surprise. somewhat of a surprise this week in the numbers. And Extension Economist will join me in a moment to discuss the new numbers for corn and soybeans. Also ahead this week, U.S. planted rice acreage may drop. Cotton hits the limit, then slips slightly after the Wednesday reports. As analysts say, the cattle market these days is all about supply and demand. This week's round of monthly USDA reports featured larger decreases in the corn and soybean numbers than analysts were really expecting. Extension economist John Michael Riley stopped by our studio a few hours after the release of the reports. He gave me his impression of what the figures mean to the grain and oilseed markets. John Michael, a lot of new numbers to digest here on Wednesday afternoon. Let's talk first about corn, I guess, or corn and soybeans. Lower production on both sides? Lower production on both sides. I think, you know, it, the, the, the water starts running there on the, uh, on the yield per bushel per acre for both these. They were reduced, which then led to a reduction in the overall production for both corn and soybeans. Uh, you know, a, a slight change in acres in terms of harvested acres, but no big, big surprises there. The biggest thing was the reduction in the, the yield, yield per acre. Corn down to 152.8. That was 1.1 bushel, bushels less than than the market expected. Soybeans at 43.5, the market was expecting a 44 bushel per acre for soybeans. And then, as I said, that really filtered through from there forward. How is the market reacting so far as far as the trade and the prices? Uh, but prices are both up. Corn's uh, up right at limit. Soybeans the same on the, the months between now and harvest, those contract months. And then as we look at the contract harvest months, uh, months from har car for, uh, for both of these, uh, corn's up about 30, 20 cents a bushel and soybeans up about 40 cents a bushel on those months. All right. Let's kind of broaden out as far as uh, looking at the world. There was uh, something in particular regarding Argentina that's worth mentioning. Here. That's right. We've got a reduction in both in the U.S. and Argentina. A lot of drought conditions down there. Corn uh, production in Argentina down about 59 bushels, million bushels. And then on soybeans down about 55 million bushels for for uh, Argentina production, uh, you know, just a, this, and so this, we're seeing this really tight supplies across the board. Uh, ending stocks in the U.S. for corn at 745 million bushels and uh, 140 million bushels for soybeans. So uh, that's those are lower than we we were reported last month. Uh, uh, just a tightening of all supplies across the board here in the U.S. and uh, and globally. And how may all this impact uh, planning decisions that haven't been made yet for this <laughs> spring? <laughs> well, the prices today are, are definitely, you know, we're, we're still fighting for those acres. We've seen cotton prices up as well, so there's, there's a, a lot of decisions to be made between now and that time. But this will uh, definitely give farmers a lot more uh, information to, to go with. I imagine some hairs being pulled right at this moment. Well, just ahead of the release of this week's crop reports, the USA Rice Federation said there could be a switch from planting rice to planting soybeans and other more profitable crops. Bloomberg News reports that rice fell 4% on the Chicago Board of Trade last year, while corn jumped 52%, soybeans surged 34%. Reese Langley, a vice president at the USA Rice Federation, said it's realistic to expect some reduction in rice acres, and he told Bloomberg that the area of the country with the most flexibility to switch from rice would be the Mississippi Delta region. The first indication of whether that may happen could be the USDA's annual survey of planning intentions, which will be released March 31st. Cotton futures ticked higher Thursday morning following the weekly U.S. export sales report. DTN says that the export numbers topped expectations at almost 358,000 running bales. Wednesday's crop and supply demand report showed only minor revisions for cotton, as expected. World ending stocks of the fiber did decline. We transition towards the livestock markets with a row crop related trivia question. Let's take a look at it now. In 2010, what row crop had the highest production value in Mississippi? The answer could be soybeans, or cotton, or corn, or wheat. You'll find out the answer in a couple of minutes. We're going to pause now for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the second half of the markets. Leighton Span reports both cattle and hog prices are trending higher. In the feature segment this week, part-time cattlemen are becoming fewer in number, but Sean Mercer of Richland, Mississippi is making stocker cattle pay.
Each year, many Mississippians are seriously injured or killed when farm tractors overturn. One cause of these accidents is improper hitching. If a tractor is hitched at any point above the drawbar, it can flip over backwards. Never hitch a tractor using the bar between the three-point hitch upper and lower links or at the top link attachment point. The stationary drawbar is the only safe location for tractor hitching. A message from the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. 23 private pesticide applicator training sessions are scheduled so far in January and February in Mississippi. This is a certification that you need to buy restricted use pesticides. Contact your county extension service office for locations or the Farm Week website calendar. The Delta Ag Expo takes place Tuesday and Wednesday, January 18th and 19th in Cleveland, Mississippi at the Bolivar County Expo Center. Doors open at 8.30 a.m. Managing resistant weeds is just one of the items on the agenda. Of course, there will be all the private agribusiness exhibitors as well. The Mississippi Agricultural Consultants Association will hold its annual meeting and continuing education sessions. January 27th and 28th takes place at the Boss Extension Center on the campus of Mississippi State University in Starkville. MSU is also the site of the annual Mississippi Crop College. It's set for February 15th through the 17th on the Mississippi State University campus. It's a great continuing education resource as well. We'll have a link on the Farm Week calendar to help you register. Go to our Farm Week calendar at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now ch check out this Farm Week snapshot. Early in the week, live and feeder cattle futures soared to new contract highs with triple-digit gains. DTN reports the gains were sparked by a combination of tough winter weather and improving boxed beef business. Analyst Walt Hackney says it is a problem that there will probably be fewer cattle feeders as this year progresses. He offered an overview of the beef situation as we begin 2011. We're going to have a very aggressive live cattle market on both fat cattle and again on feeder cattle as this year goes. Supply is going to be a driving force. <clears throat> Will they make money? Should be the question a lot of these people that are out here with just a blind impulse to buy feeders just because those fellows might ought to get out their number two lead pencil and their yellow legal pad and start doing some figuring because um, that's going to be an interesting point. This week's hog futures have enjoyed some spillover support from that cattle complex. The pork market itself is also seeing some positive fundamentals, according to DTN. New contract highs were reported Wednesday of this week on the April contracts and forward. The USDA says that higher weights are not expected to be sustained in the sector throughout 2011. Well, if you paid attention to the recent news releases about Mississippi Ag Commodities in 2010, you were able to answer our trivia quiz without any problem. Soybeans had the highest production value in the state as far as row crops. A is the correct answer. Soybeans have held that position since 2007. The subject of today's feature story knows about taking care of lightweight calves. He got into the stalker cattle business less than 20 years ago to keep the family farm and be profitable. Sean Mercer has achieved both of those goals. In 2007, his outstanding operation received the National Stalker Award from Beef Magazine. Mercer raises some eyebrows when he says that stalker cattle make him more money than growing pine trees. Farm Week paid a visit to the farm east of Richton near the Alabama state line. We try to keep everything as calm. We move every all our cattle with just a, a bucket and a truck horn. And after they get used to it, it's pretty easy. They realize that they're going to a, a little bit better place to eat, so it works out pretty good for us. The stalker cattle business is working out well for Sean Mercer all the way around. He's the third generation to farm this land east of Richton in southeast Mississippi. Sean has developed the ability to make lightweight cattle a profitable enterprise. These calves that we're looking at here probably came in weighing 250, 300 pounds and uh, they're currently weighing right at six and we'll keep them another 30 or 45 days and uh, 
hopefully uh, find someone that wants them a little bit more than we do and send them on. Sean says his grandmother, Olive Henderson, was very instrumental in his decision to get into the cattle business to begin with. That was 16 years ago, after his grandfather, Carlos Henderson, passed away. The Hendersons had operated this roadside store that still stands on the farm, in addition to running cattle on the place. One of the store fixtures was refinished and is now a piece of furniture in Sean Mercer's home. My grandparents ran that store for over 50 years, I guess, and probably closed it in the early 70s. Uh, my grandfather would open up every morning and then go farm, and my grandmother would basically run the store, and uh, they made a pretty good go of it, I guess. Uh, a mom and pop operation. The farm had traditionally been a cow-calf operation up until Sean Mercer took over its management. Although he doesn't depend on the farm for a full-time living, Sean says he quickly realized the existing setup wouldn't produce enough return on investment to ultimately buy the farm from family members and preserve it. That's when he switched gears. Up until I took over, we were traditionally cow-calf, and we just decided that that wasn't going to be enough to be able to buy, like this piece of property that my aunt owned, I just couldn't see a cow-calf operation being able to pay for that land, so we switched to stockers. Sean Mercer has never regretted his decision. He's also quick to defend why he didn't follow so many others and just plant trees on all the land. Most of the farms around here are pine trees, and we do have pine trees on some of our land around here also. We think that's a good investment, but uh, we also think that while we're able to get out here and really work and uh, put in the effort, that cattle make a lot better rate of return on investment right now than pine trees. It's obvious Sean enjoys handling the smaller cattle, a class sometimes referred to as flyweights. Calves weighing about 250 pounds, not long separated from the mama cow. This group of flyweights just arrived at Mercer Cattle about three days before this video was taken. From the moment they stepped off the trailer here, the focus has been on their comfort and keeping them calm. For example, mats are placed on the sides of the alleyways and pens the calves pass through. The goal is keeping things low stress all the way around for these lightweight animals. We put them through the chute, vaccinated and wormed them. We'll wait on castrating them, uh, blacklegging them, dehorning them, branding them until uh, they're about 300 pounds. We just want them to uh, eat and uh, come to a better place and uh, start gaining a little weight and then we'll do all the rough stuff a little later on when we think they're a little more capable of handling because most of them have probably been separated from mama for the first time, sent to a stockyard uh, somewhere in the southeast and uh, you know, really been through a stressful time. The idea of low stress handling even extends to the larger cattle. It's mostly controlled grazing with an electric wire fence around the Mercer operation. Native grasses, Bahia grass, common Bermuda, and wild millet are all used, with of course ryegrass being a cornerstone in the fall and winter. Sean Mercer says he likes to take a 250 pound calf, precondition it through the winter on ryegrass, put about 500 pounds on it and sell it as a seven or eight weight. The emphasis is on maximizing profit per head rather than worrying about the total number of head on the place at any given time. Try to keep that grass as tender as we can. Uh, use a lot of cows that we have to uh, come in and kind of clean up behind these calves to keep it eaten all. That way we don't quite, uh, we don't bush hog or anything like that. So a lot of people clip their pastures, but uh, we try to use an animal to uh, harvest that grass and try to get some type of weight out of it to turn into to some dollars, hopefully. Sean concentrates on keeping cost and overhead low so he can turn more profit per animal. For example, he contracts with others to bale hay, apply fertilizer, and do other chores. That way, he doesn't have to invest in a lot of equipment himself. Sean Mercer's hard work was recognized by Beef Magazine, which presented the operation its National Stocker Award recently. From Richton, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. And if you're interested in watching our story again, you can see it at our website, farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have a link where you can read that Beef Magazine article written about Sean Mercer when he won the National Stalker Award. And again, as we, we heard Sean say, he did his research before he made that decision some years ago to move from cow-calf to, to a stalker operation, and it is certainly paying off for him. Well, I mean, he shows that you can do it here in Mississippi. I mean, but now he does manage. I mean, you can look at the video. I didn't get to go with you that day, but I can just tell by looking at the video, his place 
he looks after it. Right, and again, he's got a full-time off-farm job, but he's willing to work, and uh, he's not down on tree farming, but he's just saying while he can work and he's got that time to put in the effort, he believes that will be more profitable. Well, he, uh, I think, definitely deserving of that National Stalker Award. We are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our show next week, we'll travel to Rankin County, Mississippi's Extension Service Office. That office is more than a place to pick up booklets. The learning here goes on outside. There are flower gardens, vegetables, and wildlife food plots. Visitors get to see many types of plants on display. In Southern Gardening, it's not too early to think about color in the cool part of the spring. And if you'd like further information on a Farm Week story or want to suggest a story to us, get in touch. Our address, Farm Week, Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. That's Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. Our telephone number, 662-325-2262. You can also contact us through your Mississippi State University Extension Service County Office. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week.